Good afternoon. I'm Adam Chidley, the Supply Business Manager from Avnet Abacus. Thank you for joining today's technical webinar on designing LoRa and SIGFOX nodes using Marata's open MCU LP1 module. I'd like to give you a very short introduction to Avnet Abacus and Marata before handing over to our presenter, Mark Porter, Business Development Manager for Marata. He will speak for around 40 minutes before we move on to a short Q&A session hosted by Richard Carter, our Key Account Manager. You can submit your questions at any time on the, in the on-screen field and we'll endeavour to answer as many as we can. If we don't get time to answer any of them, we'll send you a reply after the webinar has ended. Avnet Abacus is part of Avnet, a leading global distributor of electronic components. We specialise in interconnect, sensors, wireless, passive, power supplies and batteries with an extensive team of technical specialists who offer design and solution support to engineers across Europe. Murata is a global leader in design, manufacture and supply of advanced electronic materials, leading edge compo electronic components and multifunctional high density modules. Murata innovations can be found in a wide range of applications from mobile phones to home appliances, automotive applications to energy management systems and healthcare devices. The aim of this webinar is to provide an overview of the module as a hardware solution. We'll look at the key features and benefits of the open MCU LP1 module and how to get started in the LoRa environment. We'll also discuss how Murata will expand the LoRa product range in the near future and using the Murata module in the Sigfox network. Now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Mark Porter, Business Development Manager at Murata Europe. Mark now focuses on the RF module product line from their wide portfolio. Mark is working with Murata's European distribution channel and developing business opportunities with the wireless connectivity technologies, including LP WAN. Previously, Mark was supporting development activity for customer projects directly, with a focus on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth technologies, as well as sensors and RFID solutions. This activity included support to design engineers across the UK and Ireland, including projects with Tier 1 handset development groups, startups, and established mid sized technology companies. Mark has worked in the electronics industry for component manufacturers since 1989 on the product application side of the business after graduating with a BSc from Newcastle Polytechnic. Now I'd like to hand you over to Mark. Thanks, Adam. All right, so just to set the scene for what uh, I'll be talking about in the webinar over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Oh, we've just, sorry, we've just skipped forward too far. First of all, I'll uh, talk about the Mirata LoRa module as a generic solution. Although we'll call this a LoRa module, the hardware itself can be used with other radio protocols, and the Sigfox protocol will be in su support will be in place shortly. So perhaps I should be more accurately calling this the Mirata Open MCU LP1 module a catchy name. To make it quicker and uh, use the webinar time more effectively, I'll simply refer to this as the module. With the module we developed, our uh, we developed our solution to work as a standalone end node. The MCU is open for adding both the stack and the application, and I'll talk about the module design and why Murata made developments following this approach. I'll then talk about how this open MCU module might help in your product developments, and about getting started with the module and the LoRa network, as well as some points to consider in your designs. While Murata may be considered a relative newcomer to support LP1 technologies, we are looking to develop future solutions for this emerging market, and I'll also touch on the short to medium term development plans that Murata has. And finally, as Adam and I have already mentioned, we are working with the partners for the module to have a support ecosystem for the Sigfox network, Mirata has no bias in terms of which technology we should be supporting, and while the product was developed to support the LoRa protocol initially, there was always a hope that with our design philosophy, the module would be flexible enough to be used in an either-or approach for both the LoRa or Sigfox networks.
So looking at the module hardware um, in a little bit of detail, the design approach on Murata's side on entering into the LoRa module arena was to be able to offer benefits to our customers, helping to simplify and miniaturize a sensor node solution for the LoRa network. We accept that miniaturization may not be the driving factor for all of our customers, but if the design of a sensor node can be standalone and require the minimum number of external components, then there's the option to make the end node smaller or to support more functionality and sensors in the same size product which could be a win-win for our customers. Most of the products available at this time support a modem use case with the stack running on the module, but requiring an external host processor to run the, the application itself. What if the stack and the application could be hosted in the memory of the module and customers could have the option to use the module as a single MCU-based solution for LP1? That would be an open MCU design approach. Could the module solution support as wide a geographical area as practical with a single part number and manage regional support in the firmware? Well, if it could, then this would allow our customers to offer a single version of their product for most of the potential market geographies, especially Europe, the USA, and Asia Pacific. We selected the SX1276 RF chipset from Semtech as the best option from their LoRa transceiver range. This particular IC supports a wide RF frequency range, the ability to support higher output power with a PA boost function, support for the widest spread factor range, and offers the best sensitivity performance. We also selected the STM32L0 family microcontroller from ST Microelectronics as the best fit, best fit part to support integrated flash memory, encryption, and performance. A TCXO was selected as the clock for the RFIC, giving the best RF performance and supporting operation over a wide temperature range, as well as ensuring that the RFIC specification can be supported on bandwidths below 62.5 kilohertz, the key requirement on the ST on the Semtech chipset. With the RFIC, we have the matching between the IC and the front end switch, and the switch itself controls the PA boost output function which is supported on a dedicated path within the RFIC architecture. There are separate power connections for the RFIC, the TCXO, the USB interface, and the microcontroller. If the USB interface is not used, then the USB power pin should be tied to the microcontroller power pin, and the USB interface pins are freed up as GPIOs. The module supporting a number of interfaces, UART, SPI, I2C, and USB, as well as supporting GPIO and ADC and DAC functions. As part of the flexibility within the, mod, within the Mirata hardware, there is the ability to support up to 16 GPIOs with this module. The design of the module was also done with some enhanced security needs in mind. Skipping back to the correct slide, my apologies. We've made the design and substrate layout capable of supporting a secure element IC the ST safe from microelectronics, ST microelectronics. And in the standard module, this component is not populated. And when I talk later on about future developments, I'll talk about a module variant with this function enabled for higher level security on the LoRa network. With the Semtech SX1276 architecture, this um, slide shows a simple block diagram of the transceiver IC, and we can see some of the features which make this a good choice for the Murata module solution. There's support for both an FSK OOK modem and also the LoRa modem. The main interest on our side with the IC is support for the LoRa modulation system, but the module hardware itself is capable of supporting other protocols if customers want to use non-LoRa technologies. The RFIC itself has support for a wide frequency range. Semtech specify this device for operation between 137 MHz and 1020 MHz with the use of a high band and a, and a low band RF path. The high band path covers 860 to 1020 MHz, which is determined as band 1 in the Semtech data, and the low band path is covering 137 to 175 MHz as band 3, 
and 410 to 525 MHz as band 2. In the original design approach, the target was to be able to support 433, 868, 915 and 925 MHz bands as a global product. However, this was not a practical solution in the end, and Mirata is only using the high band path and PA boost path, with the PA boost function being common to both high and low band transceiver paths, and the low band path is not used in our design. This does still allow us to offer an LP1 module supporting the European, USA and Asia Pacific regions with operation between 868 and 925 MHz. So we're still offering a solution which has a wide ranging geographical coverage in a single device and part number, but not supporting, not supporting the 433 MHz band in the standard module. Talking a bit further about some of the, um, the features on the module, um, as a Japanese company, Murata is always seeking to make our products smaller and more effective for customer use. The basic approach was to offer as small a package for the module as possible and to try and support as simple an impl implementation as possible. We've already looked at the module hardware in a little detail a few slides ago, so I'll simply look to highlight some of the points on this overview slide. We've made the module as small as possible in the XY dimensions with a solution measuring 12.5 mm by 11.6 mm and utilizing an LGA footprint. The module is using less than 150 square millimeters of PCB area, which is round about, which is less than one third of the area used by some of our competitors' products. And with the OpenMCU design, it is possible to develop and design without the need for an external host processor which would give an additional saving on PCB area. There's a 50 ohm antenna port on the module and customers can select the best approach for a suitable antenna depending on end product design constraints. This may be a PCB tray supporting only a single band or perhaps a stub antenna supporting two or more bands. In our own certification work, we use the LPRS dual band um, 868-915 megahertz compressed whip, whip antenna with a SMA connector. For the RF power handling, the module will support a plus 14 dBm output level at the antenna port for the LoRa modulation under normal operation. Lower power levels can be set in the module using firmware. The RFIC and the module themselves support the power boost function where regulations apply um, of up to 20 dBm. And there's the usual trade-off in current consumption with higher power. In our module design, the current consumption for plus 20 dBm output power uh, is a little over three and a half times the current consumption for, the, um, for an output power level of plus 10 dBm. Since the LoRa technology lends itself to battery-operated equipment with low data rates and low power, our module's capable of supporting a wider supply range than most other technologies in our lineup. The module will operate between 2.2 volts and 3.6 volts, although when operating with the PA boost function, the lower limit should be increased to 2.4 volts. We developed this module to support an industrial operating temperature range with the TCXO assisting in support of the minus 40 degrees C to plus 85 degrees C operating range, and the device has a metal shield can for the best RFI performance. The module has been tested and certified for FCC and, ICC re and IC requirements based on our initial evaluation board and the LPRS antenna mentioned earlier. And the ID numbers are marked on the module. As the module does not have an integrated antenna, the radio certification for FCC is on a limited single modular transmitter basis. We also provide a guideline document package for reuse of the Murata FCC certification into customers' products. The module has also been tested and passed um, the requirements for CE. This time, testing was based on the ST Microelectronics Discovery Board, and the module complies with EN 300-220 for RF performance, EN 301-489 for EMC performance, and EN 609-50 and 62479 for safety aspects. 
When the EMC spe specification revision for RED is published in the official journal of the European Union, we will carry out any required retesting and support test certification as necessary. We've already tested and passed the relevant RED requirements for the, the updated RF performance specifications. Moving on to look at the reference design for the module. As you can see from the slide here, the reference design for the Mirata model, module is relatively simple and straightforward. We have a hardware design guide available for download from our support portal, the My Mirata support site, to help further with best practice design approach. The Mirata support portal also includes antenna information, PCB footprint file, information on the Mirata evaluation board layout, certification test data, as well as useful links to both the ST Microelectronics and Semtech web pages relevant to, for the LoRa technology. Decoupling capacitors are referenced on the, on the VDD lines, and with a module design philosophy, it doesn't make sense to include large capacitance values like the 10 microfarad parts inside the module, as these take up a disproportionate amount of substrate area. So these are external to the module itself. The TCXO voltage can be taken from the VDD line or from a GPIO pad on the module, which is pad number one. And the TCXO can also be used as an external oscillator for the STM32 microcontroller by connecting to module pads 45 and 46. Or the microcontroller can be driven by the integrated crystal contained inside the module. The VREF plus function is used to support the ADC and DAC functions, especially for best accuracy when using lower voltage level inputs and outputs. The module is supplied with a 50 ohm impedance antenna port and connection to a 50 ohm antenna should be made using a 50 ohm strip line on the main PCB design. Mirata would also recommend a Pi circuit layout is used on the antenna line to allow for compensation due to mismatch from mechanics PCB structure and other real world conditions. Adding this into the design at the beginning will make it simpler to compensate for any detuning of the antenna uh, in real life and reduce the need for a PCB respin to optimize RF performance. The hardware user guide on our support portal also includes advice about the internal connections between the microcontroller and the RFIC, as well as the microcontroller and the RF switch to assist with software design issues. As a result of the close collaboration between Murata, Semtech and particularly ST Microelectronics on this module, we have been very lucky to get the support of ST Micro in providing a development environment for the Murata module. The hardware is supported by a dedicated discovery board and the software and firmware is supported by the software expansion release iCube LR1. For the discovery board, ST Micro have adapted their approach with other STM32 discovery boards and made a version specifically for the Murata module, i.e. replacing the microcontroller and perhaps a Nucleo LP1 add-on board um, into a single discovery board. This particular discovery board is using a version of the module which does not include the AES128 encryption function, which is this Dash091 module version. And without this encryption, easier shipment is um, outside of the EU is possible without the need for export control, making this more suitable as a global evaluation tool. The discovery board incorporates the ST-Link debug interface tool, as well as extension connectors for Arduino to allow easy functional add-on for sensor boards, etc. And the board can be powered by a USB connector or the included battery pack. It come, the, board, the, the discovery board supplied with a registration code for the Murata support portal and an antenna. The board is, was developed and supplied through ST Microelectronics and it's supported to end customers through the same distribution partners that are supporting and supplying the Murata module. For the iCube LR1 release, um, this provides specific support for the Murata module, as well as other solutions like the Semtech Nucleo board. This includes libraries and some standard applications and supports an, a number of standard compilers like Keel. Project, um, 
Projects included in the um, in the iCube release in, are AT Master, AT Slave, EndNode, and Ping Pong. And all of these help you get a, as quick a feel for the LoRa technology as possible. Today, the release is supporting Class A and Class C operation. Um, full range of frequencies from 433 MHz through to 925 MHz. And based on the latest release of the LoRa stack, version 1.0.2. The standard Murata module is supplied as a blank module. It actually contains a very small amount of firmware to, to ensure that we can test the part in, in the factory, but essentially this is a blank, um, a blank module. This means that the flash memory in the microcontroller um, is available to support both the stack and the application, with 192k bytes being available in total. The LoRa stack is using something like 50k byte. So that leaves something like 140k bytes available for the application. As a blank module, I should highlight that the unique identifier is not included in the module on Murata's side. This unique identifier is the equivalent of a Wi-Fi MAC address, and this needs to be obtained separately from the IEEE and then flashed into the module as part of the production process together with the stack and the application. Today, the Mirata module supports operation in Europe, North America, and Asia-Pacific regions, with support at nominal 868 MHz for Europe, 915 MHz for North America, and 925 MHz for Asia-Pacific. As we discussed earlier, the RFIC we selected, the Semtec chip, um, does operate over a wider frequency range, but performance limitations from that matching circuit limit the scope of frequencies we can support in the module. The module is supporting the LoRa modulation and utilizes the specific support for the Murata module developed by ST with their iCube tool. So simply start development with the discovery board and the iCube release to get you up and running with the, the LoRa technology as quickly as possible. Support for Sigfox is coming soon uh, with a dedicated firmware support release developed on the S by ST Micro. Like the LoRa firmware, this will be available from their website with a click-through software license agreement. The module hardware is supporting FSK and OOK modulation, so it is also possible to support other radio protocols with the, uh, with the same module, although there's no formal ecosystem for doing so. With the Murata module, as an open MCU design, it's possible to develop the EndNode solution for LoRa for the LoRa network as a compact standalone um, solution. With the module, you're getting the benefit of a shorter time to market because it's simpler to develop the hardware. Resources for design can be diverted to other parts of the project, and the overall solution will be of smaller size than with discrete ICEs, thanks to miniaturization offered with a, a, um, a highly integrated module solution. So looking at the sensor end node um, and, and, and a typical approach that customers might want to take, with the Murata module, um, the hardware solution for the end node um, can be managed quite simply for the LoRa network. You need power from a, a battery or suitable power supply if, 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 if there's a connection for mains. Select the range of sensors needed to support the data collection required, whether that's temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, airflow, liquid flow, etc., etc. Select a suitable antenna for the end node product package. Develop the LoRa application for the embedded STM32 microcontroller. Assemble the PCB, flash the module in production, and get connected to the LoRa network. And there you have an end node solution without the need for an additional host processor which should help support your product development activity with a quick time to market and a small sized hardware implementation. Simple, which is very easy for me to say. Moving on to a few slides related to the, the LoRa network. The LoRa network um, can be a public or private network, which is different from other LP1 technologies. Um, with a, the, 
The cost of the infrastructure for Laura is not too high. Um, an outdoor gateway would cost uh, something around about 2,000 euros. Uh, indoor gateway, perhaps something like four or 500 euros. And this would allow companies who want to be able to collect and process data within their organization to deploy a private LoRa network cost effectively without the need for very expensive infrastructure. Public networks are already supported in a number of countries and the number of countries with LoRa public network coverage is increasing month by month. In January this year, it was 34 countries and the latest data from the LoRa Alliance is that this has now increased to 50 countries. The LoRa Alliance itself is the non-profit organization helping drive the standards and LoRa te and technology for the LoRa protocol. Uh, the membership's open and also growing at a similar rate to the network deployment, with over 500 members now, um, up from 400 in January. As you can see from the graphic here, um, taken from the LoRa Alliance homepage, many European countries already have public networks in existence or have made public announcements for rollout plans. Some emerging markets and geographies are deploying LoRa networks because of the key benefit that LoRa modulation gives, which is long range. Perhaps two kilometers in urban environments and 10 kilometers or more in non-urban envi non -urban environments. So for countries like India, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, where there are areas with low population densities, and long distances, as well as clusters of high population density, these are very good candidates for LoRa networks to support remote data collection with a relatively low cost infrastructure. So let's talk a, a little bit about getting your LoRa device activated on the, uh, on the LoRa network. The LoRa network um, offers users a bi-directional acknowledged data transfer um, solution and deployment of the network is by a simple star of stars topology, which is simpler to manage and implement than an, a mesh solution. In the network, support made for low data rate with a low cost approach and supporting long range and long battery life, the basic uh, principles of LoRa technology. Before an end, end device can communicate on the LoRa WAN network, it must be activated. In order to do this, we need the following. The device address, dev ADR, a network session key, net, network S key, an application session key, app S key. Talking about these in a little more detail, the device address is a 32-bit identifier which is unique within the, net, in, within the network. The device address is present in each data frame and is shared between the end device, the network server and the application server. This differentiates nodes within the network, allowing the network to use the correct encryption keys and properly interpret the data. The network session key, NWKS key, is a 128-bit AES encryption key which is unique to each end device as well. This will be shared between the end device and the network server and provides message integrity for the communication as well as supporting security for end device to network server data transfer. And finally, the application session key, Apps key, is also a 128-bit AES encryption key and unique to each end device. This time, the key is shared between the end device and the application server independently of the network session key and is used to encrypt or decrypt application data messages and provide security for the application payload. To exchange this information and join the network, two application methods are supported with LoRa. Over-the-air activation, OTAA, based on a globally unique identifier and using over-the-air message handshaking, or activation by personalization, ABP, where shared keys are stored at production time. With the over-the-air activation, the end device sends a join request to the application server, which contains the dev EUI, the app EUI, and the app key. The end device receives join accept request from the application server, which the end device authenticates and extracts the dev address, the unique identifier in the network, and then derives the security keys for the network server and the application server, NWS key, and access key respectively. 
With the ABP approach, the device address, network session key and application session keys are configured at the time of production and there's no handshaking over the air. The device is ready to communicate on the network without additional procedures. And the Murata module is supporting both, um, both versions of activation. Looking at security in the, in the network, so any device on the network will have a unique identifier, like a Wi-Fi MAC address. This is needed for the OTAA operation. And in our OpenMCU module, this is not provided on our side and needs to be sourced from the IEEE based on the number of devices that would be required to be connected to the LoRa network. They have different schemes for low, medium, and high numbers of unique identifiers. Within the LoRa network, the network will assign the device address as that unique identifier for each node in the network. And the network session key gives security by encryption for the path from the end node to the network server, but doesn't allow the network server to decrypt the data package being sent to the application server. The application session key, the access key, gives security by encryption for the path from the end node to the application server and prevents the network server decrypting the data package. The LoRa network is bi-directional and the end node will communicate both to the application server and the application server communicate to the end node. This is slightly different from the, um, the Sigfox network approach. And today, this is supported in the LoRa network, in LoRa, LoRa network using two types of communication modes. Class A mode is the conventional communication approach as a unicast message with the end node making a data transfer to the application server, the uplink, and then listening for the application server in predetermined receive windows for acknowledgement or other requests. This is the default mode for use on the LoRa network, and all products should support Class A mode. The other mode available today is Class C, which is an extension um, based on unicast or multicast messages, where the application server can initiate a transmission at any time, and the end node will be in listening mode, except when transmitting data to the application server with the uplink. So still supporting the uplink function, but also able to detect a message from the application server anytime it's in listening mode. Moving on to the developments that Mirata is making for LP1. The family of the LP1 modules are under a generic part number, CMWX1ZZABZ-XXX. where the XXX is changed to three digits depending on what functionality is supported in the module itself. So today we have the standard OpenMCU module as the Dash 078 variant, which has been in mass production now for um, almost one year. And this is the mother part for the family on this slide. Under this is the Dash 091 module, also in mass production. Um, this is without the AES encrypted microcontroller and this is the part that appears on the ST Micro Discovery Board. So we're using this Dash 091 part to support business in countries outside of the EU, like Russia, Israel, Switzerland. Uh, but of course, the 078 part can be used in these countries when suitable export licenses are taken out by the shipping partner. Looking at the um, near developments, so very close to being mass production ready on two variants of the module. The top part, the modem use case dash 079, sorry, dash 093 module is a solution where we're incorporating the DEVI UI, the unique identifier, and we're flashing firmware to configure this open MCU module as a modem. This configuration will support AT commands over a UART interface on the module. And the module package is the same as the dash 078 version, the mother part but pin configuration is fixed in terms of the interface available for use. So this will offer a, a very small size modem in the LoRa module market, and do, but does require the application to run on an external host. So this product should be finalized by the end of this month, end of October, uh, with, a current, with a mature firmware release being completed a few weeks ago. 
The other part, which is very close to mass production on our side now, is the 1NM module. A different part number approach to, presume, to, to just to prove that the exception is the rule. Uh, this module is the same module size and package as the mother part, the 078 version, but re-engineered to support the LoRa band in China at 470 megahertz. So this module can also provide support for 433 MHz ISM band, but with slightly lower performance over the electrical specification for 470 MHz because of that internal matching circuit. The 1NM part is using a slightly different RFIC from Semtech. This time we're using the SX1278 transceiver, and we're using a crystal instead of a TCXO to run the RF, um, the RF clock function. We're not, this module will not be supported for the Sigfox protocol or network, as there's no Sigfox network in China, and the, which is the market driving this product development. A little further away in terms of the mass production timing is the support for the Sigfox network, and that will be based on the standard 078 OpenMCU module. I'll talk about this um, in, in a few more slides in more detail. And finally, um, way out on the right-hand side of the, um, of the timing graph there for you, um, is development um, of, a, a, development of a, um, oh, my apologies, I've missed out, sorry, not so far over on the right, um, the development of an open MCU module with the secure element function supported by ST, um, ST's ST-Safe um, device. The approach we're talking about here is to offer produc a production product with three flavors of the module, each populated with generic keys encrypted to support three turnkey management partners. And these are Actility, G&D, and Jamalto. There'll be a dedicated part number for each of the part numbers as a dash 096, dash 097, and dash 098 variant. The secure element in the module will be programmed with a generic key to support the related TKM service via a join server. When making the connection to the LoRa network, the key in the secure element within the module will be authenticated by the join server, and if genuine, access will then be granted to the main network and application servers. This increases the level of security for the Murata module on the network. Further out uh, on the right-hand side of the graph, um, on the right-hand side of the, the graphic, we're investigating options and concepts for modules to support narrowband IoT technologies. Since we're a module manufacturer and not an IC maker, we generally need to handle developments based on commercially available chipset products, so there's always some small lag with emerging technologies for module offerings. But some solutions for the narrowband IoT modules will be around um, and available for customers round about this time next year. Moving on to the final topic of the uh, of the webinar discussion uh, today, which is support for the Sigfox protocol and networks with the Murata module. The Sigfox solutions is a slightly more mature technology um, compared to LoRa and there's already established network coverage across many geographies. One key difference between the Sigfox and LoRa usage is that with the Sigfox, is, is that with Sigfox, uh, the connection must be made over a public network, whereas LoRa can allow use on a private network. As you can see here with the, uh, the map image from the Sigfox website earlier this month, there's network coverage in many countries in Europe today. Coverage does vary from country to country, for example, in Benelux and France, France, which is the uh, home of Sigfox, there's excellent coverage. In other countries, there is coverage of areas with higher population density, like Sweden, from the centre of the country, through from Stockholm through to Gothenburg, and in the UK, with major city areas covered like London, Birmingham, and the belt between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Sigfox are looking to have networks in all countries and already have a presence in 36 countries, with 17 countries globally um, having national, full national coverage. Interesting, the, the, um, some of the countries which have national coverage include Singapore and Mauritius, as well as many yeah, European countries visible on the map you can see in front of you.
So the largest benefit we see coming from the design philosophy Mirata made with the module is that the same hardware can be used to support different radio protocols. The same open MCU module can be used for supporting the LoRa pro used to support the LoRa protocol can be used to support the Sigfox protocol and access to Sigfox networks. There's no change to the module hardware, the Dash 078 open MCU solution, uh, to support either LoRa or Sigfox. The relevant stack and application can be flashed to the module memory in support of either protocol. With the support of our um, key partner, ST Microelectronics, development is in the final stages for a firmware release specific for the Mirata module for use with Sigfox. In the near future, this will be available on the ST Micro website and downloadable by customers in the same way as the LoRa firmware release is today. The main difference in the firmware that will be that while the LoRa release could be considered open source and flexible, the Sigfox release is a more closed version with AT commands being used. There will be a cube release specifically for the Murata module and Sigfox, and this will be as a hex file, and there will be support documentation available um, in terms of the AT commands and also how to configure the module um, on the discovery board for use with Sigfox. During the development phase for customer products, Mirata will manage the release of a header file um, as a .h and binary, which will have security keys encrypted for use with the module. Customers will arrange this using the cube release firmware from ST Micro to generate a signature code from the module which is on the discovery board. Mirata plans to process that signature code on our My Mirata support site and release header files for those specific modules. This will be managed for a small number of modules during the development phase. The plan is to support something like 20 keys per customer uh, using this process. The header files released by Mirata will be specific for each module and rel related to the signature code. Sigfox themselves will support a development token from their web portal to customers with access to the network for a predefined period of time, maybe six months. For the personalization in the module, um, replace the generic Sigfox header supported from the firmware release with the individual module specific one provided from the My Murata support site. Compile the Sigfox project on the preferred supported compiler tool, load the project into the module, and the module is then personalized for the Sigfox network. Today, the firmware is supporting RCZ1, RCZ2, and RCZ4 regions and there's planned expansion um, of the release of the firmware to support RCZ3, which is for Korea and Japan, and that should happen around about the end of this year. Murat has already done certification work for Sigfox with the module on the three supported regions today. In the production process, um, this will be slightly different uh, to the um, development uh, process with the keys and token organized directly between the customer and Sigfox via their web portal. Murat is not directly involved in this side of the activity. At the moment, the understanding is that the module can be programmed in production for use either on the LoRa network or a Sigfox network. It might be possible to develop some form of software switch into the module and flash the OpenMCU module with the LoRa firmware, the Sigfox firmware, and a vanilla flavored application making software switching between the two networks and protocols. It's a little bit too early in the activity with the Sigfox firmware today to be sure that this is an achievable approach. But we will be investigating this together with ST Micro over the coming months. And so in summary then, the OpenMCU module Mirata offering for LP1 technologies offers a quick time to market a simple design implementation and a small package size, allowing flexibility for use in products and especially allowing for development of a standalone sensor node for the LoRa network. The product supports the main geographical regions of Europe, USA and Asia Pacific as a single part and there are product variants to support higher level security and the 470 megahertz band. The module can support the Sigfox protocol and support with a public release of the ST Micro developed firmware should be done before the end of November. 
allowing you to use the same hardware to support either the LoRa or Sigfox network use. Mirat is working on developments for narrowband IoT, so combined with our current product offerings, we can be a preferred module partner for LP1 technologies in your own product developments. And now um, there's some time allocated for some questions and answers. Thank you, Mark. Um, we'll now start a Q&A session, so I'd like to invite you, the attendees, to submit uh, any further questions that have not yet been submitted. Uh, as I said previously, if we don't get time to answer them all, we will send a reply after the webinar has ended. Um, Richard, I believe you have a few already, so what's the first question? Okay, the first question is, can I upgrade to LoRa 1.1 when it becomes available? Um, yes, that should be possible in the um, when that release is made. Uh, we're supporting the um, the iCube release is supporting 1.0.2 today, but um, further release should be planned for um, for the for the new LoRa stack as, as that becomes available. Okay, the second question: uh, the LoRa module uses the SX1276 chip. It supports the LoRa modulation by default. Can it also be used for Sigfox modulation? Um, yes, that's that's right, Richard. Yes, as, as as we covered in the in the webinar, the the hardware itself is quite flexible, so we can support the LoRa protocol, the Sigfox protocol, and potentially other proprietary protocols in the in the bands supported. So for the standard um, the standard module, the standard Open MCU, somewhere between 868 megahertz operation and 930 megahertz. Third question is, can you use your own LoRa pro protocol stack on the MCU? The protocol stack for the, the Mirata module has been supported by ST Micro specifically, so customers will need to use that um, ST Micro release available through the iCube. Okay, and will the, will, the, will the software be included in the module? Um, our standard module, the OpenMCU um, product, is supplied blank. As, as, as mentioned in the webinar. So there's no software um, provided with the module. Customers can develop their um, application, um, their, their, their specific application, um, based on that um, iCube tool, and the iCube is supporting the stack itself. Um, we see that as being a, a, a benefit. You know, Many customers are already very familiar with using STM32 product, so developing their application should be quite straightforward. We do have the, the modem version of the module as that dash 093 variant, the same package, but that in, in that case, as, as we covered, that's already flashed with the uh, a standard firmware package supporting um, AT commands over UART. So one, one version is empty, one version is supplied with the, um, with the software firmware for the, um, at least for the modem. Okay, we have some further questions. I don't know if we'll be able to answer these ones now, but we can get back to you on this. Uh, so the question is, do you support the Radio Shuttle peer-to-peer -peer LoRa protocol? Oh, that's a, an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't come across that before. I mean, generally, the LoRa, the LoRa network itself is not a peer-to-peer -peer, um, operation, so it's not a mesh um, protocol. The um, there is a ping pong application in the iCube release, which essentially is is communicating peer to peer. But uh, my understanding is that, that the network itself doesn't support um, peer to peer opera peer to peer operation. Okay, another question. Again, we may have to get back to you on this one. How do you compare to the Sparkland Wireless IO2 LP1 WLRS 590 series? I think this is one we'll probably have to look I think into. We, yeah, so off the top of my head, I, uh, yeah. I, I, I won't be able to answer that one, we can, but we can look into that. Okay, so unfortunately, I've, we'll have to stop it there. We've run out of time, um, so we'll have to wrap it up now. But thank you to Mark, Murata, and all of you for attending. Um, just on the sign-up, everyone will receive an email following the webinar with a link to the web, chat, web page where attendees were able to view a recording of the webinar and download the slide deck. Share the on-demand webinar with your colleagues. Download the new Murata IoT and MEM sensor brochures. Find out more about the key products and order samples. Find out more about battery solutions for LP1 applications and speak to one of our technical specialists in your local language. 
Thank you and have a good afternoon.